was that uh, different parts of your brain light up when you're thinking about who you are. I'm gonna say who the hell you are. Uh, who you are. <laughs> I'll try to control myself. I'm working on it. Okay, so they, they did a study. This is in Denmark. Uh, it's actually done in China. Uh, I mentioned to you last time that uh, Ma actually means two different things. It either means mother or mule, one of the two. So we'll assume this one means mother rather than mule. Anyway, this was done in China. Uh, they, they uh, I don't know why they called it a Danish study since uh, half of it was done in China. Anyway, so uh, Ma and his colleagues uh, did a functional MRI on individuals. They asked them about uh, who they were, and uh, when they did, uh, so certain select, uh, sections of their, uh, their uh, brains lit, lit up, the, specifically the medial prefrontal cortex. And of course, that, uh, that seems to have something to do with uh, judgments about who you are, judgments about yourself or self-judgments. <clears throat> and when the researchers performed the same functional MRI on Chinese participants, uh, their medial prefrontal cortex was only activated when they were considering personal characteristics. If they were considering other characteristics, who they were socially, uh, other parts of their brain uh, were activated. When the Chinese thought of their social roles, their uh, temporal parietal junction was activated this is a region that more typically is involved in understanding other people's beliefs. In other words, you're trying to determine why those people, uh, how, how those people think about you. So the Chinese, when they were asked about, uh, as far as the Danish were concerned, uh, when, whether they t uh, asked them about uh, their, their role in the society or who they were as an individual, uh, it was just the one section of their brain that, that lit up. Uh, but as far as the Chinese concern, were concerned, two different parts of their brain lit up. So that they thought of themselves differently, uh, their social roles differently from their individual roles. Now, oddly enough, uh, the Danish, the social role and the uh, self, the role of the self, uh, was exactly the same. Ma et al. in 2012 suggested that Chinese participants were more likely thinking about other people's beliefs when they thought about their social roles. What do, how do other people see me? That's what they were trying to figure out. Uh, though, we, though we are all individuals, humans are also a highly social species. And now we're going to talk about how social we actually are. And what we're going to determine is that, uh, or what we're going to see is that it's a continuum. <coughs> Some people are very individualistic. Some other, other individuals are very group-oriented. Some people are very independent, and some people are very interdependent, as it turns out. Social, social interaction is a continuous balancing act between focusing on our differences and seeking our connection with others. Uh, the more individualistic we are, the less we care about how, how others see us. And that's one of the reasons why, they, why we refer to ourselves as interdependent. Marcus and Kitayama uh, first identified the independent view of the self in 1991. So uh, I started, started studying psychology in 1976. Uh, these guys hadn't even done their research yet. So we, had, we didn't even have this concept of self uh, back in 1976. So you can, you can imagine what the psychology text looked like uh, 15 years before they even discovered this, or even thought about this. Independent individuals experience their identities as largely distinct from their relationships. Independent individuals are self-defining. They, they define themselves by their attitudes, their personality traits, their preferences, their opinions, their abilities, their individual qualities. Remember when, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, I was talking about the 20s, uh, the 20 statement uh, questionnaire that, that uh, they will give to individuals. Uh, the 20 question, the 20 statement questionnaire uh, for the independent person, uh, they're mostly looking at who, who they are. And actually, that's what they're supposed to be answering. Uh, but as we saw, there were, there were various cultures uh, that uh, identified the self by who they were in society, not who they were as an individual. As confusing as that is. So if I, if I gave that 20, 
20 statement questionnaire to the people in this room, how would it turn out? I actually did this at Ashford. Uh, I had used the 20 statement questionnaire, and I could use it here, I guess. Um, but it caused a little bit of controversy. Because, what, so how do you think people would? Well, um, I remember when, uh, when, uh, when uh, the new company came down to the cafeteria, um, we were placed in the uh, in the order, uh, conference room, uh -huh. and I, I noticed like uh, about probably three fourths of the room uh, identified themselves as individuals, and the other, the rest of the other, they uh, uh, identified themselves as community members. Fascinating. So this one quarter, this famous one quarter that saw themselves only as part of the community, yeah. he's actually one person actually set their plan and. And that, that sort of way. Fascinating. And he wasn't even a student. Was, was that right? <laughs> <laughs> so the three quarters that identified themselves as independent individuals, mm -hmm. they included all the people from Alaska, I assume. And the, the three fourths identified themselves as individuals, and the rest of the rest of the um, employees, they described they themselves as community members of what they do in the community. <clears throat> Right. And that one person identified himself with his plan, plus um, his individual value, and then uh, kind of breaks down to a community member. So what side were you on, Francis? Yeah. Where you on? I was the community. I ended, I, I uh, ended myself as a student. Okay. And then so you were one occupation, and then a community member. So you were? part of the three quarters. Yeah. 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 Which makes sense because you've traveled, you've traveled a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that, um, uh, that gives you a, a sense of uh, separateness from the people around you because you, you travel and, you, and you've lived in places that, uh, where you weren't uh, a member of the majority group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that gives you a sense of, uh, of self as well. Yeah, these members are from Alaska, uh -huh. and uh, that is the part where I was just um, observing how they would introduce themselves from that point. I noticed the, the two head, the vice president and the general manager, were facing together, their knees facing together like this. Oh, really? Like, uh, they intimate. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the two chefs were more straightforward, and looking at everybody with open hands. And, these two people have to make money together. Yes. And these two people have to make food with everybody yes. out there. Yes. <laughs> fascinating. That's just fascinating. Thank you. Okay, so an independent person will, uh, will self-define their attitudes or personality traits or preferences, opinions, uh, abilities, and individual qualities, uh, whereas an interdependent person will identify themselves by their, uh, by their group and, and what the group is all about. Uh, the self's experiences are rather stable and does not change much from situation to situation. The independent view of self is experienced as self-contained and exists as a relatively coherent and inviolate in entity. This is really kind of interesting. When I was in the military, of course, I'm a Hoosier farm boy. I'm from I'm from Indiana. I was I grew up on a farm. Uh, so when I went to the military, of course, they were trying to turn me into a a soldier, a military member. <laughs> they were trying to turn me into a military member. A lot of individuals, when they go into the, in, into the military, it's really kind of fascinating to watch them because if they go to Texas, they start acting like a Texan. If they go to Mississippi, they start acting like a Mississippian. If they go overseas, then they become part of their unit. They be, they're very interdependent on who these people are or who they're around. They try to get along with everybody around them. And uh, when, when I went into the military, I, I specifically wanted to stay who I was. Uh, so primarily, I stayed a, uh, a farmer from Indiana, uh, not changing the way that I thought. I, tr I tried to make sure that I didn't change the way I thought. I didn't change any of my beliefs because I was in the military. I didn't start drinking coffee, which tastes really bad to me. I didn't start drinking coffee because everybody around me was drinking coffee. I didn't start smoking because everybody around me was smoking. 
I didn't start drinking because uh, everybody around me told me that to be a good soldier you have to get drunk. <laughs> they didn't say that, but what they did say was, oh, well, we have such a stressful job, we need to get drunk after we're, after we're done. And I just didn't change. I just stayed the, the same person I was. Well, I'm a very independent person uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, one of the reasons is because I grew up not only in Indiana as a farmer, but also I didn't go to church, and everybody else around us went to church. And so we were kind of rejected people. We were, we were isolated because of our lack of faith, lack of faith, uh, therefore. And uh, one of the things that happened was that I was used to being rejected. So it didn't bother me to be different from people. Uh, so when I was in the military, it didn't bother me at all. Uh, and I'll talk more about the, the military <laughs> in a minute. I've been, I was thinking about this the whole time I was going over my notes. Individuals with independent identities still feel much closer to the in-group than the out-group members. However, they do not view them in fundamentally distinct ways. Uh, so I may be a part of an in-group, but I don't really, that's, that's not my only ident identity. Uh, a good example would be I ran track in college and high school. Uh, we set all kinds of interesting records, not that that's important, but because I say it's not that important, it, it wasn't part of my identity. I didn't use that as part of my identity, despite the fact I was part of this in-group. It didn't become uh, important to me. And here I am, 70 years old, I just thought about, wait a minute, I still hold that record. You know, it's, it's not something that, that is part of my identity. Uh, which was a little strange, I don't know if you noticed last year, I, they, I was, uh, <laughs> I was <laughs> inducted into the Hall of Fame at my high school, and uh, they put it on the, uh, on the warrior web. <laughs> I know. It was up there for like six weeks, <laughs> and I'm going, what? <laughs> Why would you do this? I had never identified, I had never identified myself as that person. It didn't really, it wasn't really that important to me. Uh, however, the people, the other people uh, uh, who were inducted, that was, that's always been part of their identity. They're like, if you've ever watched Hoosiers, there's that one guy and all he talks about is missing that one shot in the state finals or something at the state regional or whatever, the regional finals. Um, but that's never been my, you know, it wasn't part of my identity. But a lot of those individuals it was, so they really wanted to become uh, members of the Hall of Fame. They, that, that was very important to them. Uh, of course, you guys don't really care if I'm a member of the High School Hall of Fame back in Indiana. Who cares? Except, uh, but they did back there because they were, of course, they had already li always lived in the same area. The main bifurcation is between self and non-self, and both in-group and out-group members are non-selves. Uh, so for the independent individual, despite the fact that I may be part of this group, it's, it's still a non-self as, as, as far as I'm concerned. If I, if I were in, in, interdependent, uh, then uh, being a member of the in-group would be extremely important to me. It would be part, it wouldn't be a non-self. It would be part of my identity. That in-group would be part of my identity. But as an independent individual, it's not a part of my, uh, my identity. I see out-group people and in-group people as exactly the same. They are both not me. They are non-selves. Marcus and Kitty Yama in 1991 also identified the interdependent self. Uh, the self overlaps quite a bit with an individual's significant relationships. Uh, interdependent individuals are closely connected with others and are not experienced uh, and are not experienced as distinct, unique, uh, unique entities. So they see themselves as part of this group. Uh, gang members do this a lot, and sometimes uh, if somebody uh, from their gang is, is shot and killed, then of course they want to, to get revenge because that's like they killed part of themselves. Uh, but uh, as an independent individual, you don't have that, uh, that understanding, that idea isn't in your brain. Uh, this is just another non-self. So if a par part of your group is, is uh, well, we see this on baseball in baseball all the time. Somebody gets plunked. Uh, by the pitcher, uh, one, the batter gets plunked by the pitcher, and then both sides come stream, uh, streaming onto the field uh, to, to fight each other because, because they hit one of, my, one of your people. That was the idea. And of course, uh, since uh, 
they're, they're going to attack the pitcher for hitting the, the, the uh, batter. Uh, the other team comes onto the field to protect their pitcher because it's an, it's it's an in-group situation. And sometimes they get really, really violent. Some of those brawls, those baseball brawls, get very violent. You would think that there'd be more brawls in football, but there aren't any brawls in football. Uh, but there are lots of brawls in hockey. It's a really violent sport. In baseball, you don't usually hit each other. You don't usually slam into each other. But in hockey, of course, you check, one side will check the other. In other words, they'll knock them into the, uh, into the uh, boards. Uh, so there's a lot of aggression going on back and forth and a lot of retaliation. Interdependent entities are grounded in their relationships with others. Relationships come in a variety of forms and they require people to take on particular roles such as father, student, friend, lover, uh, daughter, uh, that govern how they feel and behave toward their relationship partners. Uh, so the relationship is the most important thing. And of course, you take on all these different uh, people, you are all these different people. I was watching a movie last night called 17 Again. 17 Again, and it had Matthew Perry and Zac Efron in it. I can't remember any females in it, it was really kind of odd. Anyway, uh, the individual uh, became 17 again, and unfortunately he was going to school with his daughter, and uh, of course he couldn't separate himself from being the father of this, this young lady, uh, so he kept trying to protect her uh, throughout the entire movie, which was kind of funny because she was, half the time she was making out with this other guy that he didn't like. So they kept getting into fights. Uh, and she thought that he was getting into a fight because he wanted to be romantically involved with her. But of course, he was her, actually her father. As odd as I know. It's a stupid movie. <laughs> uh, in the end, he realized he needed to go back and be the 39 year old man that he, he, he was supposed to be. So instead of staying 17, he went back and got back with his wife, his happy ending, big, big happy ending. Okay. Uh, the identity of the interdependent individual is experienced as somewhat fluid in different <coughs> situations. Depending on the situation and the role that the person occupies in that situation, the person's experience of their self will vary accordingly. And of course, they are trying to be part of the group. Uh, so since they're, they're trying to be part of the group, their self-identity is not nearly as important. So their self-identity will change depending on the situation. When they're the father, they act like this. When they're their lover, they act like this. Uh, who else? The neighbor? No. Student. Student. Whatever. Uh, a good example would be uh, uh, normally you drive your kids around and everything's fine. You take them wherever, the, wherever they need to go. Uh, but if you're around your parents, you, uh, you don't act the same as you do, do when you're not with your parents. You don't act the same even around your own children. Uh, my daughters, it's really kind of interesting. I, I drive, my wife doesn't, I, I drive more than my wife does. I like to drive. Uh, uh, but uh, when I'm with my daughter, my daughter drives. She always drives. And that is so that she doesn't feel subordinate to me. She doesn't want to feel subordinate to me. It's really kind of interesting. So she won't let me drive. <laughs> Which is not a bad deal because I get to sit in the back seat with my grandson. And we have a great time. We're like identical twins, except we're 60 years apart. <laughs> so we, we always have a good time in the back seat. Uh, okay, so that's, that's just the way it works. Um, where was I? Oh, when I was in Germany, my parents came over. Uh, when I was stationed in Germany back in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and we went to Garmisch Partenkirchen, if you've ever been to Garmisch Partenkirchen. It's over by Munich. <laughs> anyway, we went over to Garmisch Partenkirchen, and my father had a really difficult time with me driving. He wanted to drive. Of course, I was more used to driving on those, in those German mountains, and they were really bad. Uh, but uh, So here I am sitting there, and I'm getting kind of irritated because my dad's not doing a very good job driving. And here my daughter's in the back seat trying to tell him where to go. And she's like nine years old. She's trying to tell my dad. She's trying to navigate for my, fa my father. 
was a really uh, frustrating time for everybody involved. Relationships with one's in-group uh, members are self-defining for those with interdependent uh, selves. Uh, thus, the people in the in-group assume considerable importance, as you can imagine. Uh, so, uh, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, about how important the in-group is for the interdependent, interdependent person. People do not easily become in-group members, nor do close relationships easily dissipate into out-group relations. In other words, even if somebody leaves the group, they're still part of your group, or you still have the feelings that they're part of your group. And it's very difficult to lose those feelings, especially if you're an interdependent person. So you want somebody who is, has been part of you to, to remain part of you. Uh, this, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but at, uh, what, what was it, 8 o'clock this morning, uh, a guy uh, shot at his, his ex-wife. He had just gotten his divorce papers, had just gotten his divorce papers. So he drove past her house, she was working on her car, and he shot at her, missed her. Then he went to his own house, and he shot and killed both of his parents. Then he drove, started driving... Um, the, the police became involved at that point since there were two dead bodies in the, uh, this is in Pennsylvania, uh, two dead bodies. So uh, he started driving toward his wife's house again and uh, the police were chasing him. So he's driving at an ex excessive speed and he wrecked into her house and killed himself uh, and destroyed the house. She got the house in the divorce by the way. So he had a really hard time separating himself from his ex-wife. I'm assuming she's the one who filed for divorce, not him. Since he got the papers, that means that she filed for divorce and he got, he got the papers later. So he had a really hard time separating himself from his, as an interdependent person, he had a hard time separating himself. And so he killed, he didn't kill his wife, but he killed himself and he killed his parents, as odd as that seems. At about the same time in, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, where, where was it? Pennsylvania and Maryland. It was in Maryland. Uh, a lady went into a uh, right aid uh, distribution center and shot and killed three people and wounded two. You know, so it's like all this death is happening all of a sudden. There were two shootings yesterday. Uh, one in Pennsylvania and one in Wisconsin. And today there was a shooting in Maryland. And of course there was the, the, uh, the guy that just got his divorce papers. He was 59 years old. 59-year-old white guy. I hate to mention the fact that he was <laughs> But he was a white guy. I don't know about the lady in Maryland. They haven't really disclosed who she was yet. Uh, but it was a lady that shot these, these people. Shot and killed them. Uh, normally, when there are mass shootings like this, it's not, it's a guy, and it's usually a white guy, but, uh, so, we do have a white guy that did, uh, shot, uh, shot up his, killed his parents in Pennsylvania, and he killed himself, uh, but it was a lady in, in Maryland, we'll find out what race she was, this is really kind of exciting, isn't it? How often is it, is it that it turns out to be a lady that's part of the shooting? Yeah. Never. Women don't shoot each other. Like, in the last... I know. This is weird. This is so strange. Yesterday, the, both the shootings were males, and they were both white males, if I'm not mistaken. Is it the ladies that's causing the problems? <laughs> Makes the man go crazy? Evidently, I made that other guy go crazy, the one in Pennsylvania. I don't know. Maybe it's your, maybe it's the female's fault. I, I like to think that it's not my fault, but I've been divorced twice. But I've never ever killed any of my ex-wives, so. <laughs> I never even wanted to. I just wanted to stay away from them. Of course, they were both living with somebody else at the time, so maybe that had something to do with it. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about the Chinese again. These guys are really fascinating. 2007, Zhu, Zhang, Fan, and Han uh, conducted an, an interesting functional MRI experiment on Western and Chinese participants. They asked the participants whether select trait adjectives characterized themselves or their mothers. 
So they were trying to determine uh, whether this adjective fit their, the mother or whether it fit the, uh, the daughter. Actually, they were all females that they did the research on. This is really kind of interesting. So what do you think happened? What do you think they found? Do we identify with our mothers? Do we so identify with our mothers we can't separate our mothers from ourselves? What do you think they found in, in the Western world? Us Westerners, how, how do you think? Do you think we can identify ourselves separately from our, our mothers? Do we separate ourselves from our mothers? Yes? Can we separate ourselves from our mothers? Are we, do we think of ourselves as our mothers? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes. Oh, God. It's scary. My mother was four foot eight. Meanest, meanest lady in the whole wide world. Just me. We're trying, spending most of our time trying to get away. <laughs> from our mothers. Okay, so that's the Western world, right? That is, no. You, we, we, we do identify with them. Yeah, because like, when you think about it, our clans, our first one is our mother. Ah, first one is your mother. It's like okay. always with us, no matter how hard. I don't think, they, I don't think they did research. No matter how hard. So. Yeah, so it's good. So maybe that's good. Do we identify with our mothers? Do you dress like your mother? Um, no, but I look like her. You look like her. Would she wear ripped jeans? Would she even no. think about the horseman? No. <laughs> that was the adjective they used, ripped jeans. Do we identify with our mothers? Uh, yeah. Yeah? No. Edison, do you identify with your mother? Just through marriage. <laughs> so you, oh, you married your so your wife is like your new. What I meant by that is basically, um, let me see here. I guess uh, for me as, as an individual coming from another community sure. and basically getting married, um, with my own mother, she's there, yes. Sure. Um, and she's doing well, I do check on her and so forth. But uh, when I mar got married, uh, basically she had siblings. But the other siblings basically decided to move out and basically live elsewhere. So the responsibility of uh, the caretaking of uh, grandma and grandpa fell back on her. So okay. in reality, um, right now, uh, basically she's grandma. So uh, all responsibilities as far as uh, the care and providing for her and that falls back on us. So, would you use the same adjectives to describe your mother as you describe yourself? I used the word mean. I don't hide from it. Tyrone, what do you think? Do you identify, do you identify with your mother? Maybe. <laughs> and he shook his head silently. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. We do, okay. No? Yes? Yes, okay. Well, let's see. Let's see what the, uh, what uh, Zhu Zhang, Fan, and Han found. Westerners show different regions of the brain activation, uh, suggesting that they represent themselves and their mothers in distinct ways. So they actually see their mothers differently. When the Chinese were evaluating themselves or their mothers, they showed activation patterns in the same regions for the two tasks, the medial prefrontal cortex, an area linked with self-representations. Self so the Chinese very directly saw themselves in context with their mothers. And Westerners did not not so much. They, they uh, had two different areas of their brain that, that uh, uh, were activated. One when they were thinking about themselves and another when they were thinking about their mothers. But uh, the Chinese, no, they didn't. They thought of themselves and their mothers in the same area of their brains. So do you think it's because of like the relationship between them? Because you said that they tend to have a closer relationship with their family? Right. Their parents? Potentially. Not only that, but the, the, the uh, Chinese mothers are, are very directed, and they they uh, live very closely with their with their families. And when if their husband dies, they move in with the, the oldest child. So do you think among like you said among Navajos, 
I, I got a I got a fifty fifty out of the room, so I'm. I was, thinking. I was, I was gonna say that because when you listen to people's answers, it's like it's, it's half and half. But majority of the guys answered that no. Right, and I don't know that that, except for Edison, of course. But I I don't know if that <laughs> if that would have anything. I, I don't know. I it, you know it's hard to say. Does that mean he's a mama's boy? Well, of course. Does it depend on the relationship between you and your mother? Some people don't have that close bond with their mother. That right, yeah, that's potential. In the, in the Western world, we've got, especially in New York City, you don't really pay any attention to your mother. You can't wait to move out of the house. How many people could wait to move out of the house? No. I mean, no, no. <laughs> not one. Oh, man. Not only did I not want to move out of the house, but my mother wanted me to move out of the house. <laughs> Tell me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and then I expected her to move so that I wouldn't know where she was. I don't I don't want to, but um the house is getting crowded. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the Western perspective, right? Yeah, it's a Western perspective. And traditional and probably different again. Yeah. 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 But like I said, well, you you heard you can, what, you can what, do that study uh -huh. Functional MRI? Yeah, we ought to do that here and see what we get. It would be fascinating to find out if we agreed with, uh, uh, with the Chinese or the, with the uh, other Western world, with the rest of the Western world. That would be fascinating. Uh, we don't have a functional MRI machine. <laughs> They're really expensive. Tell everybody to go to today. Francis was going to buy us one, and then he thought, well, no, I'll go to the Navajo Nation Fair instead. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Francis. In independent cells have a number of close relationships with members of their in-group. However, these relationships are less self-defining uh, than the corresponding relationships of those with more interdependent cells. So we do have relationships. And of course, I've talked about my ex-wives. And you guys are probably cringing, going, my god, did, why did he marry that person if he doesn't like them so much? Uh, I, I can't tell you the answer because it has to do with something that you probably don't want to hear about. But uh, um, uh, if I were an in interdependent self, I, he, uh, in those countries, uh, divorce is, is rare, is, is extremely rare. Uh, sometimes it's outlawed because of the cultural structure. Uh, it used to be outlawed in the United States. It was outlawed in the United States until the 1960s into the 1970s. Each state had to change their laws. There was only one state where you could get a divorce in the United States, and that was Nevada. So people would go to Reno, and they had to be residents of the state of Nevada in order to get a divorce. So they'd have to live there for six months to get a divorce. But people would do it. <laughs> they hated their spouse so much, they, would, they were willing to move to, to uh, Reno for six months. Interdependent cells identify uh, more strongly with their in-group, uh, with independent cells have the more uh, permeable relationships, and of course, uh, uh, you may think it's really strange that I've, I've lived in so many different places over the last 68 years, uh, but the reality is, of course, when you're in the military, you move every two or three years, and my wife was in the military after I was, so we just kind of moved around. Um, I don't know, could you, could you handle that kind of movement, that kind of bag, that kind of a vagabond existence? You like to travel, could you do that? Yeah, I would, I would like that. It would be but, fun. I think it would be a part of the family. Yeah, it's really hard to maintain in school. Yeah. It's not easy, it's tough. And some people get out after four. And the reason they get out after four is because they sent them someplace really crappy. But they hate it, like Mississippi or Texas. I lived in Texas three times, four times. Oh my God, I missed one. One time was in Lubbock. I was in Lubbock for seven years. Has anybody ever been to Lubbock? Oh my God, it's up on the Llano Estacado. It's flat. It's so flat there that uh, it. it uh, the Yano Westacado is a mesa, and, and the mesa uh, is uh, it's an escarpment actually, uh, and it's like 15 feet difference. 
from one end to the other end. That's how flat it is. That's ridiculous. It's insane. The Comanche used to go up there and, and race their horses. They didn't live there. They just raced their horses on the, on the Llano Estacado, which means state. Anyway, not important. Okay, so as an in, uh, interdependent people, uh, their relationships are very strong. They establish these really, really powerful relationships, whereas the independent person, it's far more permeable. They can just change uh, as the wind blows. So having been divorced twice, it doesn't really bother me that much. Those relationships were permeable anyway, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and you can poke all kinds of holes in them. That's what permeable means. Uh, because in-group relations are so critical for self-definition uh, for people in more inter interdependent cultures, and because they serve to direct appropriate behaviors, it is especially necessary to identify those with whom one has such significant relationships. So an interdependent person must uh, identify all of their relationships. And these relationships become extremely important. That's why their religion is so important to them. The clubs that they belong to are so important to them. Their family structure is, is very important to them because they have to identify all of these. This is, this is their definition. So without these, without these uh, connections, they don't have any connection at all. I have a friend from, or I have a student from Bangladesh. I had, I had a student from Bangladesh. He's no longer mine. Uh, but uh, he had a problem with his family. I uh, didn't have a problem with his dad. Well, actually, he did have a problem with his dad, and that was part of his problem. But he left Bangladesh and came to the United States to go to school. Well, the only way he could do that was to separate himself from his family. Otherwise, his family would have been calling him up on the telephone and say, you have to come home now because, well, his dad died while he was, while he was overseas, uh, and, and he didn't go home for the funeral. And he's Muslim, so he was he was kicked out of the family, kind of. Uh, he was the oldest son, and he was supposed to take over the family farm, but he he refused to. He re refused to go back home. He knew if he if he went back home to the funeral that they would make him stay. So instead of doing that, he cut he severed all of these relationships that he had. So after he graduated from college, he had a year to stay in the United States. After that year, he didn't get back into a graduate program, so he had to go back to Bangladesh. But he couldn't go back to his family. So for the last year, he's been living with his friends. I know. I don't have any friends that would put me up for a year. <laughs> I barely have any family members that would put me up for a year. I spent the night over at Marius's house the other night, and I'm sure he was ready to get rid of me like the next day. <laughs> anyway, but he spent a whole year living with friends in their back room, as odd as that seems. I know. So this is how strong his relationships are with his friends, that they are willing to put him up. And while he was in the United States, he lived with, with various friends from Bangladesh. One in Indianapolis and one down in Memphis. I don't have any friends like that. I'm lucky my wife doesn't kick me out. I mean, it's close. <laughs> I, went home, I went home for the summer. I'm sure she was ready to get rid of me by the time I left. <laughs> Obligations to others are, are an important part of in-group relations among interdependent people, so it is of vital importance for them to distinguish those for whom they have obligations from those that they do not. And of course that includes family, that in includes your, your uh, uh, the in-group that you belong to. If it's a gang, you own allegiance to that gang. So th this is what interdependent people do. They qualify all of, uh, all of their friendships. Now this makes it really kind of interesting because if you move to a place, if you go to a place where there is a lot of interdependence, where there's a lot of, of uh, it's a collectivist society, like in Japan or Korea, uh, where, we, where uh, my wife and I were stationed, actually she was stationed in Korea, uh, and I only visited her in Korea, but we lived in Japan. And it was really kind of interesting because it's very difficult to uh, crack the friendship 
barrier uh, of people who are interdependent. It's really, really tough. Becoming a member of an interdependent individual's in-group is, uh, is thus a rather substantial accomplishment and such relationships should be entered cautiously because you have to understand if you become part of this in-group, now you owe them allegiance and you have to do select things. So it's hard for an independent person to become part of one of these in-groups with all of these other interdependent people because they will be expected to do this, that, or the other. Um, there was used to be a television show called uh, Northern Exposure about a doctor that moves to Alaska uh, and uh, about half of the town is, is native. Uh, well, it turns out that they're Athabascan. They're not, they're not Tlingit or, or, well, actually one of the people is Tlingit uh, or Aleut. Aleuts are the guys that live on the, uh, out on the islands. Uh, but they were, they're Athabascan, and it was uh, the uh, doctor is adopted into the tribe. <laughs> is adopted into the tribe, and when he gets adopted into the tribe, uh, he has to become part of the group. And the, his initiation into the group is that they take all of his stuff, his radio, they take his microwave oven, they take all of his stuff, and then they replace it with their own stuff. So. Yeah, so there's that connection, that really odd connection. Uh, but, he, of course, he's from New York City, so he doesn't really understand what's going on. Uh, but here he is. He is an independent person who becomes part of an interdependent group. And he has, there's a lot of culture shock that takes place in the, in the show. It's really kind of fascinating. A more independent person is likely to perceive themselves as existing and functioning separately from the social environment. Uh, the environment is more tangential to the independent person's identity. It's, not, it's, it's peripheral. It's not important. Uh, relationships can be formed and broken without having a large impact on the independent person's identity. And of course, I've already told you about my two divorces. Not that important. Uh, and I moved a lot. And I've had lots of friends around the United States, but I don't think any of them are going to put me up for a year or whatever. <laughs> or let me drive their car. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll lend you money, but I won't let you drive my car. You can't, you can't drive my Miata. Yeah, there, Francis is going, damn. <laughs> For one thing, you wouldn't fit. It's only, <laughs> if you're over five foot eight, you don't fit in my car. Yeah, you're about five foot eight. You're five ten, five, six feet tall. <laughs> so it's not really important to an independent person. The social environment that they live in is not really important. And that's one of the reasons why I've been able to move to Mississippi and Texas and Texas and Texas and Texas and California and Montana and Iowa and Nebraska. Uh, we've lived all over the place. Ohio, I lived in Ohio for a while. Because the environment's not important to me. With a lot of, a lot of individuals, they identify themselves with where they live. Uh, some people, they identify themselves with where they live by what college team they root for. In Nebraska, everybody wears red on, on Saturday because the Cornhuskers are playing on Sat. They always play on Saturday. I know, it's really kind of weird. What, looking at people in, in red sport coats, that's really pretty ugly. I mean, it's pretty nasty. I, I have, a, I have uh, two sisters that were adopted when they were small. And one grew up with a non-native, one grew up with a Tene. So, as they got older, the one that grew up with the with the net, she she didn't really identify with the family, but she knew we were there. It didn't really do that as much or anything. Like that. Right. But the one that grew up with the non natives, she came back and she um, really wanted to know a lot more. She still keeps in touch with us a lot more than more than the one that grew up with yeah. the the they called it. We're gonna I'm going to explain exactly why that happened in the next chapter. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, I can't wait. Yeah, I know. Okay. Suspense. <laughs> People with uh, independent selves uh, are more willing to form uh, new relationships, maintain larger networks of relationships, and be less distressed uh, should any of these relationships fade away over time. And of course, that's me and my m moving around all over the United States. 
For independent persons, in-groups and out-groups are less consequential uh, to self-construction. Uh, and for that reason, of course, they can move. They can, they can go from one environment to the other. They don't, they don't require uh, that, uh, uh, that, that individual to be, uh, to be in their uh, sphere of, uh, of interaction. I have a friend, uh, when I graduated from high school, I wasn't very popular, I guess that. I wasn't very popular in high school. But um, I had a neighbor who was uh, uh, very popular. Everybody loved this guy. Uh, he was a pitcher on the baseball team. He was a high scorer on the basketball team. Yada, yada, yada. He was a hurdler on, on the track team. Uh, so everybody loved this guy. Uh, and a lot of people uh, maintained contact with him uh, for 50 years after graduating from high school. They all maintained um, contact with him because he was so important to them in high school. Well, they had, they had formed an in-group. This was part of their in-group, and he was the leader of that in-group. I wasn't a part of that whole deal. I, I didn't really care. I didn't care what Noel Peckinpah was doing. That was his name, Noel Peckinpah. <laughs> and when he came home, I didn't run down to his house to, to find out what, what Noel had been doing, mainly because I wasn't there. But uh, there were individuals who lived, who stayed, who stayed home, who uh, they, if something important happened to them in their lives, they communicated with Noel Peckinpah because he was so important to them. They were that interdependent on, on his acceptance to the extent that <laughs> one, one of the individuals uh, is a veterinarian. This guy makes lots and lots of money. There's no reason for him to even care about Noel Peckinpah, but uh, when, uh, he, <laughs> when he had, um, his, his wife had stopped having anything to do with him, and he, the first person that he called was Noel. He called Noel Peckinpah to find out if that was okay. Was this acceptable? You know, he was the, the, the uh, social judge that he wanted uh, to, to tell him that it was okay that uh, his wife was, had, was living in the barn now. Actually, he was living in the barn. His wife was living in the house. Anyway, but he, he called Noel Peckinpah. I mean, that, he, that, was, that guy was that important to that individual. There is a convergent evidence of heightened distinction between in-groups and out-groups among those who are uh, more interdependent. Collectivistic cultures like the Japanese richly describe this pronounced difference in behavior between contexts involving in-groups, which, uh, which they call uchi, and uh, those involving out-groups, soto. Uh, so if you are a soto in Japan, then that means that uh, people don't want to have anything to do with you. If you're uchi, uh, that means that uh, you're one of the gang. And you dress like the gang, and you act like the gang, and you use the same words that the gang uses. It's just the way it works in Japan. Studies have found that Asian Americans were more accurate uh, than European Americans in identifying the emotions experienced by their close friends. Okay. Their close friends. <clears throat> European Americans were more accurate than Asian Americans in identifying the emotions that were experienced by strangers. So what does that tell you about the Japanese? If you're a friend of somebody in Japan, they will understand you. They will try to uh, figure out what's going on with you. But if you're a stranger, they won't even pay attention to you. All of a sudden, you disappear. Now remember, Japan is very crowded. It's an extremely crowded country. So in order to survive in that kind of an environment where you've got people just streaming past you all the time, you have to, to define uh, yourself by uh, a small group of individuals. Most, uh, most of the Japanese live in, in their minds. They live in here. They don't live out there. So they're thinking internally rather than externally. Um, so if they were here at this, at this institution and they were walking back to the, uh, the, the cafeteria from this building, they wouldn't pay any attention to anybody unless they saw somebody that, that was their friend. Does that make sense? 
You see what's going on? <laughs> okay. Uh, as fascinating as all this is, it gets even better. In places like Japan where commitment to in-group members is strong, there should be less of a willingness to cooperate with outgoing members. In other words, people that are leaving the group. People with interdependent cells focus their trust on people that they share some kind of relationship with, and of course they have select individuals that they share a relationship with. Yamagishi and Yamagishi in 1994 found that Americans tend to have higher levels of general trust than the Japanese do. Who do the Japanese trust? They trust their friends. They trust the people they have relationships with. And if they don't have relationships with those individuals, they ignore them. If you are, if you are Japanese in Japan, you're okay. If you're not Japanese in Japan, you're not okay. They call Americans, they call anybody that's not Japanese in Japan, Gaijin. Gaijin is the person that sneaks in the window at night. I don't know who they were, <laughs> but that's not a very complimentary thing to call somebody, a Gaijin. It's somebody who is different. Now, they used to think that it was, it was white Americans that were gaijin, but the reality is it's anybody. It's anybody that's not Japanese. They will refer to them as gaijin. And it's just somebody that's not Japanese. So if you watch a movie where, well, like Mr. Baseball, it's a fascinating movie. Uh, it's actually a very, a very cultural movie because it shows how strong the Japanese culture is and how uh, un unaccepting the, the Japanese culture is. As long as you do things Japanese, then you're, you're acceptable to some extent. But you can never be Japanese. You'll never be completely acceptable. Even if, you, even if an American marries a Japanese, which isn't supposed to happen as far as they're concerned. But even if you marry somebody from the culture, they will never accept you. It just is, isn't the way it works. It's a collectivist society. They're very um, iconoclastic. The, uh, the only good people are Japanese people, as fascinating as all that is. Or not. You, you can see it any way you like. That's one of the reasons why during World War II it was so difficult for us to fight the Japanese because the Japanese killed all of their prisoners. And then it turned out that we killed all of our prisoners, or they committed suicide. Well, we didn't understand that. We didn't understand the whole bonsai attack thing where everybody gets killed. We didn't understand the kamikaze thing where they, they put bombs in airplanes and then crashed them into ships killing themselves. We still don't understand suicide bombers, do we? We just don't understand. It doesn't fit our, it doesn't fit our uh, concept of what people are supposed to do. But the Japanese are very collectivistic, and if they die for their group, then, of course, they die honored. As strange as that may see, seem. Now, you would think that this, well, this is a picture of, of a gaijin. This is a picture of, of somebody that's non-Japanese. And you can see how hairy they are. They almost look like a monster. <laughs> Bond and Smith, look at his eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> his eyebrows grow right up into his hairline. What fascinating! What a fascinating person. Look at his nose. Japanese have cute little noses. Uh, Bond and Smith in 1996 found that people with more inter interdependent views of self are more likely to conform than those with more independent views. This may be because people with more inter interdependent selves view in-group members as an extension of themselves while maintaining distance from out-group members. And of course, that's what the Japanese do. Uh, they, uh, they, see, uh, they see us as an out-group member. And they can have relationships with us. They can have tertiary relationships with us, but they can't have close relationships with us. Uh, American GIs get into trouble in Japan all the time. To the extent that they have uh, removed almost all of the American bases out of Japan. Uh, when I was there in, in the 90s, uh, we had... There were two marine bases, there were three naval bases, and I think there were four air force bases. And now there are two air force bases, 
one naval base, and the Marines have been moved completely off the island. They are gone. They are no longer there. And the reason is because they kept having problems with the Japanese, specifically with the Japanese women, <clears throat> because the Japanese women are very friendly people. They smile, they want to talk to you because they want to learn English. And um, uh, GIs, of course, with that, all that testo testosterone splashing through their brains, think that they're flirting with them, but they're not. They're just trying to learn Japanese. And of course, if, if you were Japanese and they did the same thing, you would understand that they're just trying, trying to talk. But Americans, of course, we think that they're after all kinds of interesting physical relationships that, that very rarely exist over there. They find us not attra unattractive people, whoever we are, as long as we're not Japanese. <laughs> He looked like monsters. <laughs> in 1983, we're going to talk more, a lot more about Japan. It's a, really a fascinating place. 1983, IBM tasked psychologist Gert uh, Hofstedt uh, to assess their employees' opinions and interests. Hofstedt administered questionnaires to 117,000 employees of IBM in 40 different countries. Hofstadt was able to map the individualism of all of the employees in each country. The country scores showed a clear and striking pattern. Some people were more individualistic, some people were more collectivistic. Hofstadt discovered that the most individualistic country in the world is the United States, closely followed by other English-speaking countries and by Western European nations. So it's the Western world are more individualistic than anybody else. Countries that scored high in collectivism were various nations in Latin America and Asia. Other research has found similar results. So the more individualistic places are the United States and any English-speaking country as, as, as well as other European countries. Collectivism has been found to dominate in Asia, Africa, South, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and the South Pacific. Most people participate in collectivistic cultures where interdependent cells are more common. These countries encompass more than 80% of the world's population. 80% of the world's population. That includes both India and China, which are the two most populous countries in the world. It also includes Pakistan, which is the fourth most populous country in the world. The third most populous country in the world is the United States. China has 1.8 billion people, India has 1.5 billion people, and we have 350 million people. I know, so we're number three. <laughs> and Pakistan is right behind us, and they'll probably catch us. Uh, Pakistan's not that big. Pakistan's this little chunk right there. It's not that big, so I don't know where they're going to put all the people. But 80% of the uh, population of the world are collectivistic rather than in, uh, individualistic. The state with the highest collectivism score by far was Hawaii, uh, probably because that state's a uh, large population of people from the Asian, uh, with uh, Asian ancestry, a lot of uh, Japanese, a lot of Chinese, a lot of Filipinos uh, live on uh, Hawaii. Uh, they intermarried with the native Hawaiians. Uh, and now there are very few native Hawaiians, unfortunately. Uh, the next most collectivistic states were Utah and the states of the Confederate South. Why Utah? Why would it be collectivistic? What's wrong with Utah? Or what's right with Utah? What's going on with Utah? <laughs> well, what, what is it about U Utah that makes them more collectivistic? I would say religion. So they, maybe religion or culture is, is like separated from other states. Probably, probably, and it's it's not the Mormon Church anymore. It's the LDS Church. They they said that a couple of weeks ago. They said they didn't want to be called Mormons anymore. They wanted to be called LDS. Uh, the Confederate States, of course, uh, almost all the Confederate States have large populations of African Americans. So you would think that they would be more individualistic, since there's this conflict going on between, between uh, white Southerners and black Southerners. But the reality is, of course, in order for them to maintain 
uh, the control over the black population like they do, uh, they have to have more collectivistic ideas about uh, how, how to treat African Americans. Uh, the le least uh, collectivistic states were the Mountain West, where we, where we are living right now, the Great Plains, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, North Dakota, South Dakota, the Northeast, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and the Midwest, where I'm from, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, uh, Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky's kind of part of the South. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to talk more about those guys in just a second. Let me see what time we're down. 50, 150. This class, is it 250, right? 250. Yeah. Individualism varies as a function of social class. Uh, specifically, people from higher socioeconomic backgrounds tend to have more independent uh, selves than those from poorer backgrounds within the same uh, within the same country. They did research in Iceland, and what they discovered was that wealthier Icelandic children had different ideas than uh, than the poor Icelandic children. Uh, the poor uh, Icelandic children were more collectivistic. And the richer they were, the more individualistic they are. And that's what we're seeing right now with, our, with the uh, presidency and with the individuals that uh, are uh, working in the administration. He is bringing in a lot of people that are extremely wealthy. There's a lot of billionaires in his, in his administration. One of them is Betsy DeVos. And of course, he's a billionaire several times over. So he has lots of very, very wealthy individuals. So they don't really think the same way as other individuals, as poor individuals. We have to think in a more collectivistic manner, but they can think in a more individualistic manner. So what's important to Betsy DeVos? Well, I was talking to my son the other day, and he was, our, he was talking about Betsy DeVos because he, he's a high school teacher down in Florida. They, they make Horrible wages, just terrible wages. He's, he should be working a second job, but he's, he has a girlfriend that actually has a pretty good job, so <laughs> she supplements their income. So what is it about Betsy DeVos? Well, Betsy DeVos is a billionaire, she, and they own uh, uh, for-profit institutions. They own for-profit high schools and for-profit colleges. So her ideas are completely different from, from other people who potentially could work in the administration. Middle class American parents emphasize the importance of self-direction to their children, whereas working class American parents place greater value on conforming to authority figures. Uh, so if you're a working class individual, this is, this is that class that is, is in manufacturing, uh, potentially in manufacturing. Uh, they would want you to do what you're told to do at the factory. Whereas a middle class individual, that's, I grew up middle class, uh, middle class individual, they, uh, they try to teach their children uh, to go in their own, their own direction, not to follow the leader. Which makes it kind of interesting, because I grew up in a blue collar town. I grew up in a blue collar town where there were a lot of working class people. My first wife's father worked in a factory. So she, they were working class. So she grew up working class. My dad was a banker and my mom was a nurse. We grew up middle class in the same community. And we had different ideas. And one of the ideas was, how do you spend your money? <clears throat> I told you about her stabbing me. <laughs> what the argument was about was money. She had spent all of our money. Why? Her father got paid every Friday. Every Friday he got a paycheck. And I was in the military, and the military got paid once a month. Back then they got paid once a month. Now they got paid twice a month. Is everything okay out there? They're laughing. Okay. They're laughing, they're not fighting. Okay, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, so the funny thing is, well, this isn't that funny, but uh, one of the reasons that uh, we had problems is because I was taught to be a middle class person, and she was taught to be a working class person. So she wanted to do what, what they had always done. She wanted to follow the same precepts, the same economic precepts. And since you were paid every Friday, you had a big 
you had a big, uh, you got a big payday on Friday, you partied on Saturday, uh, you partied through the weekend, and then you worked through the week. That's the way factory workers used to do things. Well, in the military, you got paid once a month. So you couldn't party <laughs> the weekend after you got paid, otherwise you didn't have any food for the rest of the month. And that, that's actually what we were arguing, arguing about when she stabbed me, as interesting as that is. My brother also married a factory worker's daughter. And uh, he, uh, he wanted to be a farmer, but she couldn't live, wouldn't live uh, in a rural setting because there wasn't enough people around. I don't know, there, she felt unsafe because there was nobody there. That seems backwards to me. Like if there's nobody there, it should be safer than if there's a lot of people around you, right? Isn't it more dangerous to have a lot of people around you? Is it more possible? Is it a greater probability that somebody wants to hurt you if there's more people around you? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Out in the middle of nowhere, you know, Bigfoot comes up, steps on you or something, or kills you, rips your head off or something. I don't know. Anyway, she was afraid. And they have the same economic problems that, that we have. She just didn't understand why she couldn't spend every week. You know, this is a big party time. So Saturday was always, you know, it was the day you went and uh, ate out. It was the day that you bought clothes. It was the day that you spent all the paycheck. And then, of course, you tightened your belt through the week. And then Friday night was, was a big party night. And then Saturday was a big party night as well. And then theoretically you went to church on Sunday. We don't go to church. Interdependent messages are a, a better fit with American students uh, from a working class background. Some of the highest concentrations of universities uh, in the United States are in the Northeast and the Midwest where individualism is more pronounced. Psychological research within the United States has been largely conducted with participants who were even more individualistic than most other Americans. It's really kind of fascinating. So if we look at uh, the people in Ohio, the people in Indiana, the people in Illinois, in Pennsylvania, they have a ton of different institutions, uh, different colleges. Different, uh, different environments have different educational structures. Uh, Canada, for example. Canada has an English educational system. In England, uh, there are uh, limited, a, a limited number of universities. So you have to make it into the university. You have to go to the university. You have to, you have to pass a test to get into the university. In the United States, we have lots of really small institutions. We have tons of institutions. You don't have to make it to get into to college. Anybody can go to college. Diné College has an open enrollment. In other words, if you want to go here and you have a high school diploma, you can go here. You don't have to pass a test. You don't have to pass, a, you don't have to get a certain score in an SAT, SAT test. You can make it. Anybody can go to this institution. No offense to anybody here. Uh, but uh, that's just the way it works. So in a working class and in a, in a middle class uh, environment, everybody gets to go to college. So if you go to Canada, it's extremely competitive. It's really, really competitive. Well, a lot more than it is in the United States anyway. In England, it's really competitive. In Japan, it's really competitive to get into, into to a uh, um, uh, university. So it's, it's a totally different environment than, than in the United States, as odd as that may seem. So if we look at uh, the number of colleges in Arizona, you have a lot of uh, uh, junior colleges, but how many four-year institutions do you have? NAU, uh, Arizona, Arizona State. Just four? Wow. It's not very many, is it? And we're trying to turn this one into a four-year institution. You guys are in a four-year program. There's a lot of junior colleges, but not a whole lot of four-year institutions. Arizona's the same way. California's actually the same way. The California, they have two uh, university systems, the uh, use the uh, University of California system, and then the California State system. So uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, 
Uh, the original school is in Berkeley. University of California is in Berkeley. So they had the University of California system. Uh, I, I went to University of California Riverside. So they've got a bunch of them all, all around the state. Uh, but they don't have small colleges in, in California. There's not a whole lot of them. But we have uh, 15 small colleges in Indiana alone. Small colleges. And we have five major in, uh, colleges in, in Indiana. Anyway, so the Midwest and the Northeast has a lot of, of, uh, of colleges and inst uh, uh, institutions of higher learning, four-year institutions. Not so many in, in this state, which seems odd because there's a lot of people in this state. Well, maybe not that many people. How am I doing on time? 38, okay. Other cultural dimensions uh, that researchers have investigated include societal tightness versus looseness. Societal tightness characterizes how strong cultural norms are and how tolerant cultures are of deviant behavior. Uh, this predicts levels of prevention, focus, impulse control, and self-regulation. Good example would be when we talked about uh, Philadelphia and Boston. Boston, the Boston people were Puritans. Uh, the people in uh, Philadelphia were Quakers. Quakers and, and Puritans are very, very different people. Puritans, uh, they, the leader of a Puritan group can only be a male. It's a very strict society. So Boston evolved as a very strict area. Philadelphia, on the other hand, not so much. Uh, Quakers will allow women to be, uh, to be ministers, to preach to their the congregation. Puritans will not. And for that reason, of course, the uh, Bos Bostonians are, are, are tighter than they are in Philadelphia. And if you look at the uh, people that live in Philadelphia and the people that live in Boston, the people in Boston are far more uptight than the people in Philadelphia. Uh, Boston or Philadelphia has a lot more African Americans in it than, than Boston does. And the reason is because of, of uh, segregation and integration. Philadelphia is a more integrated town than Boston was. And for that reason, Boston had problems when they integrated the schools in the 1970s, Boston had a lot more trouble than Philadelphia did. As a matter of fact, of all the northern cities, Boston had more trouble than anybody else because their schools were more segregated. And so they had to bus more people. Uh, Philadelphia didn't have to bus anybody because Philadelphia was already integrated. Another cultural dimension that has been investigated are cultural values, values for universalism, uh, benevolence, uh, conformity, tradition, security, power, achievement, hedonism, stimulation, self-direction. These are things that they have uh, done research on around the world looking at different cultures. Other cultural dimensions that have been investigated, power distance, uncertainty uh, avoidance, uh, vertical horizontal social structure, relationship structure, context dependence, social cynicism, uh, complexity. If we look at India, India is kind of fascinating because India has a vertical social structure. They have, um, uh, you have to marry into your own group. You, it is suggested that you marry into your own group. When you, when you move to India, that's what you're going to have to do. Now the question is, what are we as Americans? Well, we, we don't have any. They, they have a caste system over there. And the, the people that are on top are, are called the Brahmins. Uh, the people on the bottom are called the Dalit. The and they are the untouchables. They are the people that uh, are, are, are the ones that handle things that you're not supposed to handle, like human waste. They're the ones that clean out the sewers. They're the ones, uh, most of the Hindus in, in India are, are vegetarians, uh, so you're not supposed to handle meat. Uh, even if you do handle meat, you're not supposed to handle leather. So the people that are the leather workers in India are the untouchables, because if you're a Hindu, you're not allowed to. So you can't even handle the leather from the, the, uh, the cow or the pig, especially pigs. They don't have, pigs are, are are not acceptable over there. So it's a vertical, it's a vertical um, uh, social structure. In the United States, we have a horizontal social structure. Um, if you've got enough money, you can be part of the elite. 
in the United States. That would never happen in England. In England, if you have a lot of money, that means you're, you're rich, but you're not royal. They have that whole hierarchy of, of aristocracy in, uh, in England uh, that we don't have in the United States. So what, what's going on in, in Canada? What kind of a social structure do they have in Canada? Is it horizontal or vertical? Is it vertical like they have in England, or is it horizontal like, they, like we have in the United States? Yeah, I think it's more horizontal. But they don't want to be horizontal. They want to be vertical. <laughs> they want to be like the Brits. Sure they do. Of course they do. Because that's the mother country. Uh, the United States, there are some people who live on the East Coast. They want to be vertical. Oh, my family's had money for 500 years. You know, we came over from, the, from England with, uh, we were aristocracy. We gave it up after the revolution. You know, that kind of crap. Uh, people in the South, same way. One of the difficulties in studying cultural psychology is that individuals tend to be varied and complex. Cultures are highly variable and are resistant to categorization. And this is part of the problem. You know, here I am picking on the Japanese, I'm picking on the Brits, I'm picking on the Canadians. But the reality is that there, there are a lot of, uh, you can't really categorize any different culture. We can't, we, you can't categorize your own culture. You know, you got Wilson teaching down, teaching your, you your culture downstairs. It may not agree with what your grandparents said. I mean, you may want to argue with it. Has anybody ever argued with Wilson? Nobody, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chicken shit. <laughs> Come on, he doesn't have to be right. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe his way of thinking, and you know, he's from a specific place. I think it's over by Winslow, isn't he? He's way west of here, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Who, Wilson? Did you say he's from Nashville? I'm not Uh-oh, I got a different story. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe he's just teaching you about people here. Maybe that's where he got his information. People around Salem. I don't know. Aren't the people over in New Mexico? It's, you know, their traditions are a little bit different, right? People out west, the ones that live near the uh, Grand Canyon, aren't they a little bit different? Or is everybody the same? I'm sure that everybody's different. I'm sure everybody's different. Yeah, like all white Americans are the same. Sure we are. We all carry guns and shoot people whenever we get an opportunity, <laughs> evidently. Something's going on here lately. We're awfully angry. All cultures are highly heterogeneous and contain a great variety of people, and for that reason, of course, everybody's different. Uh, if we look around the room, you guys are all di dress dressed differently. You don't have all this on the same clothes. Everybody has on blue jeans, though. That's kind of, kind of even me. <laughs> good. I'm one of the in group. Okay. Everybody have all the blue jeans? Okay. We're good. We're good. Except for Francis, and he doesn't belong here. <laughs> you have to leave right now. <laughs> Cultural differences this book describes reflect general patterns of differences and not all or nothing statements. And of course, we have to take everything with a grain of salt. When I talk about the Japanese, some Japanese people are, are individ very individualistic but they're few and far between. It's not easy to find those guys. Uh, most of them are relatively collectivistic. I mean, if you live in a country that is so crowded, you can't really be very much of an individualist. You, can't, you won't be able to survive in that kind of an environment. Okay. <clears throat> One more and then we'll, we'll quit. A number of researchers have identified women as, as more interdependent than men. Uh, the features of independent entities seem more characteristic of men than of women. There are issues of gender equality in most cultures. Do we have gender equality today in the United States? Wow. <laughs> what about in this state? Aren't you guys going to vote in November for a new senator to take Flake's place? 
right? He's quitting. He's retiring. I'm sorry. He's, he's retiring. And both of the individuals running for s the Senate are female, right? Did you know that? Is everybody going to vote? This is what happened up north. The, up, uh, up in Montana is a really conservative place. And they just screwed over the natives up there every, every year. I mean, it was bad. It was really bad. So they got together, and they decided that they were going to vote. All they needed to do was vote. And they became a voting block. They didn't always vote the same. It, that wasn't important. But they voted, and they started voting en masse. In other words, everybody that could vote did vote. And after that, the conservatives had to start listening to the people on the reservations. Now remember, there's seven reservations up there. There's seven different groups of natives. And they started all voting. And when they started all voting, all of a sudden, the reservations got nicer. <laughs> Because they started pumping more money onto the reservation. The state started pumping more money onto the reservation. They started electing people that would, would uh, support them. And that's what happened up north. It could happen down here, too. You guys need to vote. They just need to know that you voted. It really doesn't matter who you vote for. They just need to know that you are a, a, a force in this state. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. It, it happened up in Montana, and it happened in North Dakota, too. So, yeah, you guys could change the way this, the, the, the whole state looks at this. If you think they're too conservative, then vote more liberal. If you think they're too liberal, then vote more conservative. But you need to vote so that they don't ignore you, and they will ignore you. They'll pretend you guys don't exist. They, they've been trying to do that forever anyway. They, they, tried to, they want you guys to go away. So that you're not a, an entity that they have to deal with. So the most important thing you can do is vote in November. Please vote. Get an absentee ballot. It doesn't matter. You can go vote. In okay. Okay. I'll see you guys later. Let me turn that off. <laughs>